Okay, so we are still talking about cnidarians. And remember that the cnidarians include things like sea anemones and jellyfish, um, but they also include coral. So do you think coral would be a polyp or a medusa in its form? It is a polyp. So it is a polyp that is able to secrete a calcium carbonate um, exoskeleton kind of shell. And it, when it does this, it creates a reef. So when we look at these coral reef ecosystems, they can actually be very, very deep. So the, the coral skeleton can actually, the, the dead part of the coral, can actually go down for hundreds of feet in some of the ecosystems that we see. When we look at where the coral reef ecosystems are located, these are tend to be warm. So near the equator, we don't have coral reefs out on the Oregon coast, for example. So it would have to be further south towards the equator. Um, it also would be shallow. And one of the reasons why it's shallow is, is that the coral builds itself up so it creates a shallow sea. So sometimes you see what are referred to as barrier reefs, right? And so these are structures around islands. We also have a gr the Great Barrier Reef, which is around what? What's the Great Barrier Reef around? Australia. So these barrier reefs are actually set off from the mainland. Okay, and they tend to protect the mainland from wave waves. So one of the things that it does is it dissipates some of the energy coming from the waves. And so not all of the energy gets to the mainland. And so one of the good things about the coral reef ecosystems is that they protect um, islands from erosion. So the reason why they're shallow, as I mentioned, is, is that the coral builds the reef. And over you know, hundreds, if not millions of years, that reef can become very big and very deep. So when we look at the way that the coral builds the reef and where it gets its energy, we need to talk about the symbiotic relationship. So symbiosis literally means living together. And we have different types of symbiotic relationships. So sometimes symbiotic relationships are to the detriment of one and the benefit of the other. And so parasites are also an example of symbiosis. But in this example, we're going to look at mutualism or mutualistic, which means both species benefit. So the organism that lives inside of the coral has a name and it is called zooanthellae. So they put this X here because it would be awkward to write it with OOA. So that's why they put the, the X there. And this is um, a photosynthetic organism. It is actually an algae. And so it is able to capture light energy and it uses the light energy to build sugars. So it actually feeds the polyp sugars. So it provides sugar to the polyps. Now, the um, polyps are also, remember, as we mentioned before, the cnidarians are carnivorous. So the polyps themselves are the cnidarians, and the polyps are carnivorous. And so they capture food. And it could be substances that are like floating over the surface of the coral. So it could be microscopic. Um, uh, a really small embryonic organism. So it could be like um, small shrimp or it could be other things that are floating in the water. But they capture the food and then they digest it. 
And so they provide to the actual algae, a uh, limiting resource for them, they provide nitrogen. So they provide nitrogen to the algae. And this is a limiting resource because actually when you look at bare, uh, coral reefs, there's a lot, not a lot of just nutrients floating around in the water in the form of inorganic. It gets recycled really, really fast. So when something dies, it breaks down, it's recycled, and it's reincorporated into another organism. So there's not a lot of just organic material laying around. And so nitrogen is a limiting resource to the algae, and so that's the benefit that the polyps can provide. And so this is it, why it is an example of mutualistic symbiosis. So I have just a short little video that talks about this relationship and how it isn't just on the outside, but these um, algae actually get incorporated into the polyps. And sometimes they can actually get ejected from the coral. So the reason why coral tends to be very colorful is because it has the symbiotic, the symbiotic algae living inside of it. And then when the coral gets stressed, at times they will get rid of their zooanthellae and the coral will be said to bleach. And um, there's like last summer for Australia was a really bad bleaching season where almost like 90% of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia was bleached. But the good news is, is that sometimes the bleaching can be reversed. If the coral are, um, are able to survive, they can then take back in the algae that they got rid of. And so I'm just gonna play this short little animation which talks about this relationship. Oh, and I want it to be bigger than that. Am I? Oh, there we go. Corals are small animals, but they build structures that you can actually see from space. As we zoom in, we see the reefs where I work, a little island called Ofu in American Samoa. They ridge there, the edge is the coral reef. And as we zoom in, we see what those reefs are. Now the reefs are made of individual coral colonies, like we see now. That coral then is actually made up of a whole series of small polyps, they're called. This is a colonial organism. And the polyps themselves have all the structures that an animal needs. It has a mouth, it has tentacles, it has gonads, it can live, it can reproduce, it can grow. Uh, they're in a colony of genetically identical polyps. Now, the color of these tentacles, like I said, is not the color of the coral itself. It's the color of the symbiont. And as the focus racks in and out a little bit here, then what we see is that we can just see the little globules of the symbiont. Well, let's take a closer look. We'll go into a tentacle and see those. These cells, the symbionts, are not just floating around. They're actually inside the coral cells. Corals are simple. They just have two cell layers, an epidermis and a gastrodermis inside. The symbionts are inside the gastrodermis, and you can see it there. Now, this is an, a life form called a dinoflagellate. It has chloroplasts, which is photosynthetic, but it has very odd shaped chloroplasts, like these yellow structures here. We're gonna zoom in to the chloroplast itself because that's where the damage happens during bleaching. What do chloroplasts have in them? They have membranes called phylicoid membranes. Those membranes hold the proteins called the photosystem that then capture light energy and turn it into chemical energy. It's the molecules that turn all of the sunlight that we get on the planet into the food that we eat. The rain of photons down here hits these photosystems and they, they gather them up. Now, if the temperature goes up and if the, the light goes up, then they freak out. There's too much energy. The photosystems break and they no longer can function the way they do. So the rain of photon keeps going. The energy is still there, and as a consequence, that energy is now turned into reactive oxygen molecules. Those are damaging the cells, so it damages the inside of the symbiont, it damages the inside of the coral cell, and they spit the symbiont out. That spitting of the symbiont out by one coral cell is bad, but if the entire colony does it, then that's coral bleaching, which you can 
see here it's simulated of the leaves spitting out of these symbionts and the gradual whitening of this particular part of this particular coral colony. Well, when that happens across an entire colony, then the coral turns from its normal tan color into a white color. What difference does that make? The symbiont provides 75 to 80 percent of the energy the coral needs to survive, but without that energy, it can't make a skeleton and it can't live very long. So as a consequence, a lot of the corals that bleach eventually die. Okay, so coral bleaching is actually a, um, a defense mechanism because it produces reactive chemicals, molecules that then would damage the inside of the polyp. So them getting rid of their symbionts um, when the water gets too warm. So when the temperature of the water tends to get warm, then they tend to eject their symbionts. Now there is some evidence that certain um, zoanthellae are better at surviving under warmer temperatures. And so for example, perhaps um, they can, the algae can be recolonized by a different type of zoanthellae, which is able to resist the warmer temperatures. And so they're hoping that there'll be um, a little bit of resistance to climate change so that we don't lose um, the, um, uh, the coral reefs entirely. Because the coral reefs not only provide home for the coral, but a lot of other organisms is super diverse, right? So a lot of other organisms are dependent upon coral reefs. So if we look at some threats to coral reefs, we just mentioned um, warming. So global warming of waters. Okay. So this leads to bleaching. The other threat to coral reefs has to do with ocean acidification. And so this is a separate problem from warming of water. And ocean, ocean acidification is, however, related to, um, to uh, fossil fuels because it's due to the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. So one of the really interesting things about carbon dioxide is it can be dissolved by water, it goes into the water, and then it can be actually put into structures and it can be stored. So CO2 in the atmosphere can be stored in the ocean. So even the corals, when they produce their structure, it's calcium carbonate, right? So calcium carbonate is the shell or the skeleton of the coral. It's also what is found in um, like limestone and marble. So when you go to deserts and there's like this big marble, um, uh, mountain, mountain made of marble, you know that that at one point in time had to have been a sea in which cal calcium carbonate was built by sea creatures and then deposited in that area. Okay. So it can be a good thing that the ocean picks up the CO2 because we're hope we were hoping that the CO2 would be regulated. So as we produce more CO2 and put it out in the atmosphere, the hope was is, is that the planet would respond by taking more CO2 up. So the rainforest, for example, would become more prolific because there's more carbon dioxide that they can absorb. And then maybe the coral reefs could also become more prolific because there's more calcium or carbonate that they could put into their skeleton. But the problem is, is that CO2, when you mix it with water, produces carbonic acid so this is carbonic acid. So the oceans are becoming more acidic. They're not an acid, they're still at the basic um, level, but they're becoming more acidic. So 
for example, um, the ocean could be uh, 8.14. This could be the pH, right? What is a neutral pH? Seven, right? So this is actually on the basic end. So the oceans tend to be basic, but if they become more acidic, if they move to more towards seven, then what is gonna happen is, is that you're gonna to start to get shells and creatures that um, produce shells dissolving. So the fear is that shells will dissolve. And it'll be harder for sea creatures to create these shells. And there's some evidence already that this is happening even off the coast of Oregon. So when we have oyster farming off the coast of Oregon, um, they're having a hard time with the larvae because the larvae are not able to um, produce a shell that is very strong. And um, it's thought to be because the pH is decreasing in the waters. So that's a big threat to coral reefs. Another threat that is probably easier to um, fix would be siltation. So what do you think siltation is due to? Silt, so what is, where's the silt coming from? Runoff, right? So in the mainlands, if we have lots of logging uh, forests next to streams that then go out into the ocean, then that silt is going to cover up the polyps and they're not going to be able to feed. So it's going to essentially suffocate them. And so siltation is due to deforestation. And then we also have over harvesting. So even simple things like the pet trade can be a big problem because when they go out there, they can damage the coral reefs. And in some cases they use cyanide to stun the fish so that the fish will float up and then they sweep all the fish off the coral reef, right? And then they take those fish and they would send them to um, aquariums and then they would also send them into people's pet, you know, uh, personal aquariums. And so over harvesting tends to be a big problem. So there are places where they're uh, making um, coral reef sanctuaries, right? So they're trying to limit the number of people that go out and see them because even stepping on them can damage them. And even using sunscreen, um, you want to, if you're gonna go swimming in a coral reef, you want to use the type of sunscreen that doesn't have the chemicals that are damaging to the coral. Which are what? A oh, question? Yeah, um, so about the, the, as more, the oceans are more acidic. So if the calcium, or if the uh, CO2 turns into acid as it hits water, how does the coral make cal calcium carbonate if there's no? It doesn't all go into it, and so there's a balance. So some of it combines with water. It actually, this is a weak acid, so it kind of goes back and forth. Um, so this is actually how we carry, I should put a little wine there. This is how actually how we carry carbon dioxide in our blood. So we turn it, our body actually turns it into carbonic acid, and then we actually, um, uh, See HCO3. So this bicarbonate ion is what we actually carry in our body. And then the chemical reaction goes the other way. Yeah, but that's an awesome question. So this chemical reaction occurs in our blood too. Right? But we have a mechanism um, that helps to regulate our pH. Our blood pH is about a 7.4 um, in our bodies. So if the carbonic acid increases, will we be okay or if it increases, will we be okay? So we would need to stop putting it into the atmosphere. So we need to stop burning fossil fuels because the ocean is absorbing it. And we thought that was a really good thing at first. But now we realize, oops, the ocean is becoming more acidic. And so those creatures aren't able to handle that extra acidity. So the hope is, is that, um, well, there's obviously people who are, frantically trying to figure out what they can do on a global scale to change this. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the hope is, is that 
um, will decrease our CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Yeah, so we need to decrease putting, we need to decrease the burning of fossil fuels in order to decrease the CO2. So this is, you know, they talk about uh, climate change, but, um, you know, this, sometimes they don't mention of what the effect is on the oceans. Do you think it's possible for organisms to evolve the handle that though? It has to be, um, hopefully, it has to be slow enough and there has to be variation. And so there is some evidence that certain cor corals are better able to, su to survive the heat, yeah. not necessarily the acidic environment, but the heat. So some are more heat tolerant than others. And so you'd hope that those coral would survive and, and spread out, but the um, acidity is a little different problem. Yeah. Okay. So then we can talk about ecological services. And so as we go through the phyla, I want you to think about what benefits we might be deriving from these different creatures. So an ecological service is how a group of organisms or even a species So how it benefits humanity, because we need to put it in a place where people can start to uh, put a dollar amount on it, right? So, so the way that we have our um, cultural kind of system set up is all about money, right? And so we have to say, well, this would provide blah, 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 blah. How much money would you, would you get benefiting from this, okay? So ecological services would include, right, the cost of um, protecting the islands from waves. So we could put that the coral protects the islands from from erosion, right? So how much how much dollars worth of erosion control would could you say that the coral do so that we could put money into conserving the coral? rather than building walls or building artificial uh, reef or barriers to prevent erosion. Okay. Another benefit is, is that they act as a nursery. So the coral provide a nursery for important food. So a lot of the big fish that we see might start out um, as smaller fish that are inhabiting the nursery, right? So the, the coral reef provides a nursery. And so we could say from an economic viewpoint, how, does, how much does that benefit us? Um, can we put a dollar amount on that fishery industry um, to say that this is how much the coral reef, uh, reef provides? And then you could also put that it is a carbon sink. So that means that it takes carbon out of the atmosphere. So um, what uh, some people are trying to do to increase the likelihood that we um, uh, regulate carbon um, emissions is, is that they have a carbon climate ex or car a carbon exchange, right? Instead of a stock exchange, right? So this is the same thing as a stock exchange. And you might have heard of this, it's kind of silly, but is some people like, if they decide they're gonna go on a trip, they figure out how much carbon they're emitting like on an airplane flight, right? And then they take that amount of carbon and they buy credits. So you buy carbon credits to offset, offset your emissions. So if you were a corporation and you were um, burning uh, fossil fuels to produce energy, they figure out how much carbon you're emitting into the atmosphere and then they would have you give them money 
or they might have you buy a piece of rainforest or buy a coral reef, and that would offset your emissions. So regulating it in this fashion, um, whereas so the carbon sink and, you, and taking in carbon has a monetary value. Can you think of any other value besides these ones that I put up here that a coral reef might have? Tourism, that's a big one, right? So as long as people have the money to go to these destinations, right? Uh, local economies can say, hey, listen, if we destroy the coral reef, right, um, through, uh, uh, through logging practices, then we're going to get a reduction in tourism, and then that is going to take away money from our, um, from our, our country or our area. Anything else? I'm not sure that is, I guess it's an ecological service. That's a little bit different than these other ones where I'm thinking that it actually provides um, a service, an ecological service by removing carbon or creating a nursery or protecting the islands. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about with um, the Nigerians is what is called anemone warfare. And I like to talk about this because this kind of explains the distribution of sea anemones, like for example, in tide pools. So sea anemones are large polyps, right? And they compete for access to space on rocks where the water is coming in. And so if you've been to the Oregon coast, you might have noticed they kind of look like this, so these green anemones, right? Or they can be pink in color. And one of the interesting things about them is, is that they exist in colonies. So if we look at a colony, it is tends to be a bunch of clones. So this would be like one colony, right? And these are the clones. And so clones would, that would be asexual reproduction. And so if they do this through budding. They just kind of, and they fission. So they just kind of split apart. So two, if an enemy gets too big, it might just split in part and produce two individuals, right? And then you can see another colony over here, right? So this would be like a second colony. Now, when the colony gets close to one another, they can sense that they're kind of going to, they're getting close and they can kind of move, right? So the individual sea anemones can move. But what they tend to do is, is that they create on the side where they're in contact, they create um, anemones that are designed for warfare. And so these anemones right here and right here would produce special tentacles that can damage each other. So they actually get close enough proximity that one can reach out a tentacle and it's a specialized tentacle and they reach it out. And they actually, when they come back, it's actually, they can pull off tissue and so they're kind of fighting with each other for access to space. The interesting thing is, is that these that are on the inside do not, right? So the ones, the, the polyps, even though these are clones, these are all genetically identical, the ones that are on the inside do not produce those special types of tentacles. And so there is something about the environment that is, that is affecting gene expression. Genes are being turned on and turned off. And so it's kind of interesting to see how they are able to detect each other and then cause that much of a genetic change. And so this is just a, an image here. I can't remember what this image is actually. Of. I think that these are the tentacles, the specialized tentacles. They look different than the other ones that they're using actually to fight each other. So these white colored tentacles are the ones that are the defense tentacles and the the fighting tentacles. Is that like kind of fast when you're watching it, or is it kind of like slow? It is slow. Yeah. But it explains the distribution because in this case, space is a very limiting factor, right? 
And so certain colonies can do better than others because they are better fighters. Okay, so we are moving on to um, a new phylum. So we've talked about the phylum Porifera, the phylum Nidaria, and now we're gonna talk about phylum Platyhelminthes. This one means, Platy means flat, and Helminth means worm. So the characteristic of these organisms is, is that they are dorsoventrally flattened. So dorso is back and ventral is my belly. So I'm not flattened this way. I would actually be flattened back to front, right? Or back to belly, dorso ventrally flattened. The other characteristic of them that is important is, is that they have bilateral symmetry. And so they have a head end and they have a back end. If you look at the front end, it is called the anterior. And then the back end is the posterior. Dorsal would be the top and ventral would be the belly. So this is the head end. So bilateral symmetry goes along with having a brain. And so hence we have a head. So if you think about a sea anemone, sea anemones don't have a back or a front. They don't really, I guess they do have a dorsal and ventral surface, but they don't have an anterior or posterior surface, right? So this is the first time we see what is called cephalization. So think cephala means head. And so this is where we have a brain. So remember that the jellyfish lacked the brain. They did not have a brain. The other thing about them is, is that they have an incomplete digestive tract. Just like the sea anemone or the jellyfish, meaning that they have only one opening. So they only have a mouth slash anus, right? Food comes in and food waste products leave through the same opening. Okay. So we're gonna watch a short movie that talks about flatworms and their diversity and their significance in the scheme of animals. So this is kind of the first organism that we see that is moving through its environment in one direction head first, right? And so that's a very significant um, a feature that distinguishes it from the other um, radially symmetric organisms. We may never know which animal was the first hunter, but scientists believe there is an animal living today that gives us a good idea of what that ancient trailblazing ancestor looked like. This animal is a flatworm. They may be among the most obscure animals on earth, but near the base of our family tree, a similar creature was the first to move with intent to explore the world, to hunt. And their direct descendants have spread to every corner of the world. Scientists have described about 20,000 different species of flatworms so far, tenaciously surviving in almost every environment, on land, in the oceans, in freshwater ponds, and in the strangest habitat of all, inside the bodies of other animals. The 
development of the hunter is one of evolution's great success stories. Like many flatworms today, the modern planarian is a smooth hunting machine. But so too were its ancestors, and they lived over half a billion years ago. An ancient worm was the first to develop a new type of nervous system, a centralized one, hooked up to sensors at one end of the body. This was the first animal with a head, within it, the first brain. In that head were some stunning innovations, a pair of eyes, eyes that could sense both the intensity of light and the direction from which it came. Placing sense organs near the brain helped fire signals to the rest of the body at top speed. Those signals could spark a sturdy set of muscles running down and around the entire body. These muscles, along with millions of tiny cilia, propelled the worm on a power glide over a self-made cushion of slime. Talent for the hunt is a legacy of the ancient owner, the first animal to have sensor organs in stereo. Two eyes, two nostrils, two ears. Stereo senses allow a hunter to sense exactly where its prey is by triangulation, then react and adjust in mere fractions of a second. The mouth of the flatworm, oddly, is not in its head. It's on the underside of the body. From this mouth, the flatworm launches a device called the pharynx, which it uses to suck down its prey. As the planarian scavenge a fish, the pharynx goes into action. Once inside, food moves through a gut so extensive it reaches to every square millimeter of the flatworm's body. Some of the most sensational sexual habits in the animal world are found in the sandy shallows of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. Over millions of years, some flatworms here have developed remarkable sexual equipment and strange ways to go with it. In fact, the first hunter was also the first animal with an internal system to deliver sperm to an egg. Basic internal fertilization changed the shape of life. The flatworm's ancestor combined the ability to move with a new way to mate. These innovations still define our sexual lives today. We may never know what the first animal courtship was like, but these flatworms can show us how even simple animals add their own twist.
for them, sex is more like war than love. It's known as penis fencing, and the worms are the swordsmen. From the midsection of each flat worm, double daggers protrude. Each dagger is actually a penis. The first one who can make a successful jab delivers its sperm. Sperm can be injected anywhere on the skin where it's then absorbed. The losing flatworm must then bear the burden of motherhood, committing valuable resources to having offspring. Flatworms are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female sex organs. Being hermaphroditic is a great strategy to maximize the chances to reproduce. Primordial worms may seem simple, but they were the first animals to pursue food and sex. They changed the shape of life on Earth. More than half a billion years of evolution separate these modern animals from ancient worms. Yet even the most powerful beasts today are still built on the same plan, bilateral, with a head and a tail, and sophisticated stereo senses directed by a brain. Worms were the first animals built with this blueprint. And the same basic design builds a human today. It may be hard to believe, but humans and flatworms have a lot in common. Cells in a developing human are told when, where, and how to grow. All because an ancient worm was the first to assemble the genetic instructions for building this brand new kind of body. And it all began eons ago with a body that went out into the world and conquered. Okay. <clears throat> so all of those were actually free living uh, flatworms. And so when we look at the classification, we have a group that are considered to be free living. And then we have some examples of parasites. And so when we look at the um, free living ones, these are called, and I just, I just oh. well, we'll look at the parasites first. I'll remember the other one. <laughs> okay. So parasites, we have trematoda. So does anybody know what the common name for trematodes are? These are the flukes. So for example, we have some species of flukes that reside in our bile ducts, and um, they're called liver flukes, and that we could get from eating um, or consuming, like for example, raw fish. Okay, we also have cestode, cestoda, so these are the tapeworms. And then I now remember the free living ones, which are called turbillaria. So these are free living. 
So these include the planaria, which we're going to look at in lab this week. So as the video mentioned, we have a brain. We also have some complex sensory organs called eye spots. And the eye spots are not able to see images. Remember, we did see another organism, the box jellyfish, that actually had eyes that are thought to perceive um, images. We also have these structures along the outside of the body that look like ears, but those are actually for chemical sensation. And so when they smell, they're able to turn their head in one direction and turn their head, and then that's how they triangulate to find their prey. They also have a very um, uh, convoluted digestive tract. And the reason for this is, is that they lack a circulatory system. So this digestive tract has to carry nutrients throughout the entire organism from that central mouth anus, right? So the food comes in and then it gets delivered. They're also flat because that increases the surface area over which they get oxygen and then also able to get rid of waste. And so oxygen, they don't breathe, but rather oxygen just diffuses in through the surface of their body. So here's a picture of a marine flatworm. Oops, this is an example of a terrestrial flatworm. And um, these are actually showing up as exotic species in Florida. So when you buy potted plants from tropical places, sometimes they come with the soil and the soil has in it larvae. And so these are um, exotic um, invasive species of land planaria. And interestingly, one of the things that they feed upon are earthworms. And so here you can see the land planaria is actually kind of attacking the earthworm and it's using its pharynx to um, release digestive enzymes to um, try to get nutrients from the, from the earthworm. Eating it, Eating it alive, yes. Yeah. We do not have terrestrial planaria here. Um, it's probably too cold for, the, for them to survive. Okay, so let's talk about endoparasites. So endoparasites live inside the host. So endo. So this is versus ectoparasites. So like fleas and ticks are ectoparasites. But tapeworms and flukes are considered to be endoparasites. There's also some roundworms. So we'll talk more about endoparasites when we get to the roundworms, because heartworm, for example, or hookworm, or pinworm, those are all examples of roundworms that are also parasites. So when we look at some of the characteristics that the flatworms have, um, these seem to be beneficial to the way that the parasite would live. So when we talk about them have being flat, this means that they have a high surface area to volume ratio. And remember, we talked about this in the experiment we did last week. So the smaller the organism, the greater the surface area to volume ratio. And if they're flat, or if they have appendages, that would also increase their surface area to volume ratio, right? So the endoparasites, um, could or may be able to absorb nutrients across the surface of their, um, may, sorry, may, maybe, may be able to, may be able to absorb nutrients across their surface. So this would be tapeworms. So as an adult, the tapeworm doesn't even have its own digestive system because it resides in the digestive system of the host. 
So being flat means that it's got a very big surface area and it just absorbs the nutrients directly across the surface, surface of its body. They're also hermaphrodites, meaning that they both have both male and female reproductive structures. And so in this particular instance, if you're a parasite, you are kind of trapped by yourself, right, inside of the host. And so you could um, either have self-fertilization if you are alone, or if there's more than one of you inside the host, you could have cross-fertilization. So what self-fertilization means is, is that you produce both egg and the sperm, and then the egg and the sperm come together and um, produce a new individual. So it's still sexual because it's the production of egg and sperm, but it is cross-fertilization would increase the diversity more in the offspring more than self-fertilization. But if you're stuck and you're the only individual, you can self-fertilize. So but either way, they still produce genetic different. Yes, and so it's kind of hard to think about that. But if you think about, um, say, if you could, I think I mentioned this before, if you could take an egg, if you could take two gametes from me and put them together, the offspring would be slightly different from me because it's a recombining of my genes. And so technically that offspring would be different than if you took a skin cell from me and produced a whole other individual from that skin cell, that would be genetically identical to me. So self-fertilization is still a example of sex. Okay. Okay, so if we look at some examples of tapeworm adaptations, for example, so this would be the cestodes. These guys lack a digestive system. They do have a structure on the end, on their anterior end, called a scolex. And the scolex is an organ of attachment. Because if you think about it, food is moving through the digestive tract, so you could potentially just flush your parasite out unless it's attached to your digestive tract in one way. So the scolex is at the smaller end of the tapeworm. So this is, notice this end right here is the small end. And then this would be an electron microscope picture of the scolex. So it has hooks and it has suckers. And when scientists are studying the diversity of tapeworms, they notice that there's lots of diversity in the shape of the scolex. So, you know, frogs have tapeworms. Even like um, invertebrates have tapeworms. So tapeworms tend to be species specific and um, they tend to have different shaped scolexes, and so that's a way that they classify them, is by looking at the structure of the scolex. The other thing that is unique about tapeworms is, is that they reproduce asexually by budding segments. So they bud segments. And these are called proglottids. So this is asexual. So each segment of this worm is a proglottid. And so sometimes we say that tapeworms show segmentation, but it's not true segmentation because really it is, is just, it's asexual reproduction. So they're not truly segmented. So I'll put, I'll put not truly segmented. The truly segmented organisms include earthworms and like um, arthropods, like insects. The reason why they bud these segments is, is that each segment is capable of reproducing. So essentially they are just egg factories. So each segment has both ovary and testes, and they release the sperm to the outside 
So for example, this segment right here could be releasing sperm, right? And if this is the only tapeworm in my intestine, then that sperm could come back into another segment. And it could be used to fertilize the eggs in this segment. So at the very end of the tapeworm where it is large are the mature proglottids. So this is the mature proglottid. So they call these gravid proglottids. Oops, let me see if I can spell that. Gravid. Yeah, gravid. And these are full of fertilized eggs. So these are what drop off. So at the very end, these would drop off and these leave the body, leave the host via the feces. So sometimes you can notice this on a dog or a cat, right? Um, they look like little specks of rice, but if you look at them really carefully, you can see them moving. So they're just these little segments that drop off and they kind of wiggle, they move a little bit. But they're super, super um, uh, resilient so that they do not die and so they can stay in the soil for long periods of time as well. So the, another characteristic of endoparasites is, is that they have complex life cycles which allow for dispersal of their offspring. Okay, so I'll put complex life cycle allows for the dispersal of the or offspring. Because if the offspring just stayed in this host, it would never be able to move to another host and it would never be able to disperse away from where it originated from. So does anybody know what the most common um, secondary host, where do the, what, what picks up these eggs if you're talking about your cat or dog at home? What is, what are they, what is picking up the eggs that they then eat that, so that the life cycle can, can be completed? Does anybody know? They could do mice, but that's not the most common one. Not flies close though, we're thinking insect. What are dogs always licking and trying to bite off things? Fleas, okay. So the secondary host of cat or dog tapeworm can be a flea. So the flea eats the eggs, and then the egg hatches out and forms a larvae, and then the dog eats the flea, right? So dogs eating their fleas can spread tapeworms. So um, if you look at the tapeworm life cycle, this is actually, um, actually, let's look at the dog one first. Okay, so this is the dog or cat one. So this is from the Center of Disease Control. So the reason why they would have something about dog and cat tapeworms is, is that we could accidentally become the host for cat or dog tapeworm, right? So that tends to be able to um, mature in us so that it's cross species. So here is um, the flea. So the flea um, develops and the larva develops, excuse me, let's see, the flea is ingested by the host and then it develops and then it produces those uh, gravid proglottids, which then um, are taken up by the flea. Okay. So one way that dog or cat tapeworms could be transmitted to humans is if you um, accidentally ingest a infected flea. You're like, why would I ever ingest a flea? But generally it could be kids, but it also could be that they're licking your face. So if they've just eaten a flea and they lick your face, you might accidentally ingest the, um, the flea and then get the tapeworm. Yeah. So because fleas bite, is there any way that there's it's just transmitted through water? Is that 
it has to be ingested because it's got to get into your gut. Yeah. So flea biting you is not going to transfer the tapeworm. That's a good question. You can get rid of tapeworms. So you take an amatocide, right? So that's why the veterinarians are always trying to get you to bring your cats in occasionally and get them and dogs and get them dewormed. Yep. Okay, so let's look at the human tapeworm. So I think this was just in the news where some guy had, had been eating sushi every day, right? And he developed tapeworms, right? So we can get tapeworms from um, from uh, pork. We can also get it from beef, but you can also get it from raw fish, okay? And so in this case, the larva is pretty smart because the larva insists where we eat it, right? So the, it would insist in the skeletal muscle. So the larvae of the tapeworm gets into the skeletal muscle and it stays there. And if it never gets eaten, it cannot complete its life cycle. So only if it is taken up and eaten will the life cycle be completed. Okay? So that's why they recommend that you um, that you cook your meat um, because that will help to prevent tapeworm infection. And um, for sushi, they spend a lot of time, uh, here's what I've heard, is that they actually spend a lot of time looking at the meat and making sure that they don't see any larvae insisted in it, right? So they inspect the meat pretty carefully and they pick them out if they find them, right? I don't know if they pick them all out, but anyway. Do they die and eat it or get cooked? They do. So it has to be a certain temperature. That's why they also recommend certain temperature. So you have to cook it, yep. So eating raw fish could put you at risk, but if you cook the fish, it'll be fine. Yep. So getting tapeworms is not the end of um, the world, however, because tapeworms tend to not kill their host, right? So they actually have a symbiotic relationship so that if you die, they die as well. So generally what it does is it can cause abdominal pain and it can cause you to lose weight and it can kind of make you feel sick but it generally does not kill you unless you get too many tapeworms, perhaps that, and you become, um, maybe your immune system gets weak and you're not able to fight off other infections. Okay. So trematoda, these are the flukes. Oops, flukes. So for example, we have liver flukes. One type of fluke, however, has a very interesting life cycle. So we have liver flukes in humans and other organisms have liver flukes as well. As well. So this is where the adult lives in the bile duct. The eggs leave with the feces. Oops, feces. In some instances, the uh, eggs, then if they're deposited in water, right, so if they get into the water, they can be taken up by a snail, and then the fish can eat the snail, and then we can eat the fish, and then the life cycle will be completed. Okay. So eggs eaten by snail, snail eaten by fish, we eat the fish. And interestingly, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. You know, the snails don't get eaten by the fish, right? They might just die, and then the parasite would die with them. Okay, so the example that I want to give is one of my favorite examples of parasites, and it's called Dicrocelium dendriticum. So this would be the species name. 
Ifrocelium dendriticum. And this is the example of the cow, the snail, and an ant life cycle. So the adult in this particular instance actually lives in the cow. So cows can have parasites that live inside of them. So this would be one that also lives in the digestive tract of the cow. So the cow is the primary host. Okay. So that means that's where, where the adult lives. So that's where the egg and the sperm come together to form eggs. And so the eggs leave with the feces. The feces are eaten by a snail. But in this particular instance, the snail um, doesn't get eaten by the ants, but rather the snail releases the larvae in what are called slime balls. So um, slime balls with the larvae are released from the snail. So these slime balls, the snail doesn't actually produce them, the larvae do, and the, they just get deposited in the soil. And so the ants eat the slime balls. So has anybody heard of this, this uh, life cycle before? Okay. So how if ants typically are down near the soil and cows are typically grazing up high, how does the ant get back to the primary host? How does it, how does it increase? How does this parasite increase the likelihood that it will complete its life cycle? Does anybody know? Is it better, the, it's unlikely that they'll actually eat the ants because the ants are on the soil level and cows nibble at the tops of the blades of grass. So the answer is, is that, that this parasite infects the ants and causes them to essentially turn into zombie ants. Okay. So the infected ants have a different behavior than normal ants. So the parasite influences their nervous system. So the infected ants crawl to the tips of the grass, tips of grass, sorry. They uh, latch on, wait to be eaten. So this is at night. So I'll put that in parentheses. So instead of going back to the colony, so most ants would go back underground to their colony at night, the infected ants act differently. So they crawl up, they latch on, and then they wait. And so they sit there all night, and if they don't get eaten by a cow, then they come back down and they perform as a normal ant during the day, except at night, instead of going back to the colony, they go back up the blade of grass until they finally get eaten. Okay. So this is just an uh, adaptation by the parasite to increase the likelihood that it would actually finish the life cycle because those are strange hosts. So here's a diagram of an uh, image or actually a diagram. So this can occur, occur in cows and sheep. This is very common in Europe. So it's not so common in North America that we have this life cycle. So if we look at the adults, this is the fluke, the adult fluke. It actually has a digestive system. So it still has a digestive system, unlike the tapeworm. It has a mouth at one end. And so when it latches on, it kind of feeds off tissue. So this is the egg. 
it is taken up by the snail. And then this is the slime ball with a bunch of uh, larvae in it. And then this is eaten by the ant. And then the ant is eventually eaten by the grazing animal. And then the life cycle is completed. So like with the ant, is there like something like chemical that makes it want to crawl on the grass? They think that it, um, you know, I don't know if it's a chemical. I think that it actually somehow it infects their brain. I'm not sure if it's chemical. There is another parasite that you're probably more familiar with. It's a viral one. So can you think of a viral parasite that changes the behavior of its host? What's an example of a virus that would change its behavior so that it's, that virus is more likely to be spread? Oh, maybe. I haven't thought about that one. That wasn't the one I was thinking. I'd have to do some research on that one. How about when you get bitten by a bat? For example, this was in the news. You get bitten by a bat, what do you want to be uh, vaccinated against? Rabies. rabies, right? So the rabies virus, right? It makes you aggressive. It makes you like froth at the mouth, right? Virus comes out and you want to bite something, right? So if you're like rabid, if you're an animal, you're rabid, you bite something and it actually increases the likelihood that the virus will be spread. And so that's another good example of how you can have something infect or influencing the host behavior um, to increase the likelihood that the, um, that the thing would be spread. Any questions about that idea? Yeah. That is interesting too, yes. So it's really interesting because your microbes in your gut seem to influence what type of food you want to eat. So if you have a particular type of microbe, like candida, then you're gonna to wanna to eat more sugars. And if you can change your microbiota, um, you can actually be less likely to crave sugar. Yeah, that's awesome, that's a good example. Uh, they're actually symbiotic. I guess candida is a pair, more parasitic though. Okay. Okay, so this is the last phylum we're gonna talk about today, and then I'm gonna give you some homework. So the phylum rotifera. Roti means wheel. So this is wheel bearing. Like porifera was poor bearing. Rotifera is wheel bearing. And the interesting thing about these organisms is that they're all microscopic. But they are actually a little bit more complex than the flatworms. And the flatworms can be, get kind of big, not really big, but they can get sort of big. When we look at the, their complexity is, is they have a complete digestive system. They also have what is called a pseudocelum. So if you haven't watched the video, on the animal body plan. You want to re watch that before Wednesday because I talk about what a coelom is. So a coelom is a body cavity. Flatworms do not have a body cavity. So they're said to be acelomates. We have a good body cavity. So we are eucelomates. So we have a coelom. So if you think about our body cavity, it's different than our digestive tract because our digestive tract runs through a fluid-filled space. So a pseudocelin is just a body cavity that um, is only partially enclosed in mesoderm, but it has a body cavity. So we'll put that the flatworms lack a body cavity. So flatworms have no coelom. And that makes sense because they are dorsoventrally flattened. So Nutrients and oxygen and waste can just move directly across the surface of their body. Okay. So if we look at an example of a rotiferin, this is what it looks like. Oops. <clears throat> so 
So here you see on the mouth end, so they have a mouth and they have an anus. Um, on the mouth end, they have this wheel um, structure that creates uh, movement. So they're actually just filtering food from the water. And so this wheel structure just kind of moves and they capture food and it goes into their digestive tract and they um, pass it into their stomach and their intestine and then it comes out their anus. And so then you can see that they also have a pseudo seal, which is that false body cavity where their digestive tract kind of sits. And so let me see if I can, I forgot to look up for a rot rotifera video, but I know there's interesting how they behave. Okay, so this is your, the, this is through a light microscope. And so here you can see this is the rotifer and it has yet to kind of stick out its wheel like organ to create, um, there it is. So that's the wheel. And so that would draw water into its digestive tract. And you can see the movement of its digestive system here. Oops, I just like, I touched it in it. So these are things that you wouldn't be able to see with your own eyes because they are microscopic. Okay, so the next phylum that we're going to um, talk about are the mollusks. And so I have another homework assignment which is due next Wednesday, so a week from today. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to the video on the shape of life, and I want you to watch the video on the mollusks. That website actually has lots of awesome videos. So if you're interested in watching more about the Nigerians, um, you can find Nigerian, all different kinds of videos there. And then what I want you to do is I want you to answer the questions. No, the assignment. This is on the assignment. So the assignment due the 29th of January, the video link is here. You can probably just type in shape of life go right to the website. Oh, sorry, I meant next, oh, sorry, I meant next Monday. Sorry, a week from today. I thought it was Wednesday for some reason. So a week from today, so the 29th. And um, you can turn in assignments late, but it's a 10% decrease per day. So, um, so if you didn't, I think almost everybody turned in their assignment. So make sure that you turn it in. And even if you have to turn it in late, it's better than not turning it in at all. OK, so that's it for today. Um, yes? It's actually due Monday. Sorry, I was thinking it was Wednesday today. It's due a week from today. Yeah, I know.